I've made quite a few of these vintage reprint sewing patterns over the years from Butterick and Simplicity, but I've never made one from Vogue. So I thought it was finally time to try one out. Now this pattern came highly recommended to me from Miss M Vintage on Instagram and it's V8811. It's quite a simple design with a grown on sleeve, French dart and a circle skirt. So I chose a fabric that would really make the most of this pattern's simplicity. I got this fabric at the Knitting and Stitching show in 2019. So it's been in my stash for quite a while, <laughs> but I'm glad I saved it until I knew about this pattern because I think they're gonna be a perfect combination. This video is going to be a little different in terms of style because I want to share a bit more of my process with you in terms of pacing. While it makes a nice relaxing viewing experience to have these videos smoothly edited together. In reality, I can only work in small chunks over several days to help manage my pain and fatigue. I know many of my viewers face similar challenges, or maybe you're just busy, but I thought it might be helpful to share how I tackle sewing projects when I can't work for more than a few hours at a time. So for this dress, I already had a bit of a head start because I'd already cut the tissue pattern pieces to the right size. This is a job I save up for days when I want to do something productive, but don't have the energy or focus for something more challenging. That way, when I am feeling up to cutting out, my most difficult part of the process, I can just dive right in. The only frustrating thing I found about this pattern was that if you lengthen or shorten the bodice, as I always have to do, not being very tall, it completely messes with the diagonal French dart. I mean, what is going on there? I decided that I wasn't going to try and figure it out until I was sitting down, so I just roughly cut around that bit of the pattern. I had previously cut a size 14, but as I started cutting, I noticed the finished garment measurements on the tissue pieces had a lot of ease. So I just cut along the lines for the next size down. I appreciate some people don't like to do this because they want to extend the life of the pattern, but I just didn't have the energy to faff about. I needed the cutting done as soon as possible so I could sit down. I often do a rough cut around the pieces and then trim them up sitting down, but this viscous fabric was so floaty and lightweight and the pattern piece is so large, I needed to take advantage of my bigger standing height cutting table. And then that was it for day one. Literally all I did was cut out the pattern. The next day, or actually it was a week later until I was up to it, I could start on transferring all the markings. I like to use chalk. It was just what I was taught to use. And I like these refillable chalk pencils because they're easier for me to use. You might prefer something different. It was then time to figure out that diagonal dart. What I decided to do was to transfer the small circles where they were with the weird shortened pattern piece and then redraw in the lines that connect the dart legs. That way I should keep the dart in the right position at the bust point and at the side seam, and it's just the angle of the dart that is changing as a result of the shortened bodice. With all the markings transferred, I took a break, made a cup of tea, and then came back to start overlocking around all the raw edges. There weren't a huge number of pattern pieces for this design, but the skirt pieces are large, so it took a while. Then that's it for day two. Overlocking I find tiring because I have to get the overlocker on and off the shelf where I store it and it's heavy. And the noise it makes is really grating after a while. So once the overlocking is done and the overlocker back on the shelf, I'm done for the day. So day three, which was the next day, I started on actually constructing the dress. So if you've been around on this channel for any length of time, you will know that I like to do this order of operations known as task batching. So I pin everything that I possibly can before I even get out my sewing machine. So I've got everything pinned. So these are my pockets pinned, all my facings are pinned together, the darts and the bodice and the skirt are pinned together. So now I'm going to get out my sewing machine and sew all these things that I've pinned. And then that will probably be like it for this session of sewing. So I will check back in with you once all of this is stitched. Now it's my old Benina here. This project was filmed last year before it finally gave up the ghost and I got my new one. I start with the smallest and easiest to sew pieces, just because I like to have an easy win to get me into the swing of things. So on this dress, it was the neck facings and the armhole facings that got seamed up first. Then I move on to the bodice darts and then the long skirt seams which I didn't film because the pieces were so big they kept getting tangled in the tripod. With as much sewn as possible, I got out my iron and pressing tools to start pressing all the seams I had just sewn. At this point, the side seams are still open because I need to press that diagonal dart that goes into the side seam, 
before I stitch that seam closed. Not only is it just easier to get a good press if that seam is open, but it'll mean the seam will also look cleaner. With everything pressed, I carried on sewing the neckline facing. This again was much easier to do with the side seams open. So I matched the facing to the neckline with the right sides together and began machining around the sewing lines I had marked on previously. I took great care to round out the corners at the bottom of the opening so that it would look crisp when turned through later. You're a dazzling Eiffel beautiful girl I could never trifle if I had you You'd be my dream come true There may be blondes and brunettes that are hard to... I sewed very carefully around the neckline making sure that the seam allowances at the shoulder were all lying in the correct direction and nothing was getting tucked up underneath the presser foot. When I pivot at the corners, I also like to reverse for a few stitches to act as a bit of reinforcement in that area. Because I'll later clip away that seam allowance, it'll become a weak point. So a few extra stitches just stop it from fraying too much. Then again, rounding out the bottom of that V opening to make it easier to turn through and look neater. Then the scary part. With my embroidery scissors, I cut between the stitching for the V opening, making sure to cut a V shape into the rounded corners at the bottom. I also clipped the points at the top and checked the points would be sharp when turned through. Then I notched into the curved neckline. This is quite a close neckline and so the curve is very tight and needs lots of clipping. With all that clipping, the facing should then lie nice and flat, but I also wanted to understitch it in place. So I pressed the seam allowance open, making sure to press the seam allowance towards the facing. I won't be able to understitch right the way to the points at the center back, so I gave those a good press from the right side now to encourage them to lie as flat as possible. Then I machined the seam allowance to the facing, close to the seam. I tend to use the inside edge of my presser foot as a guide. I really used my hands to spread the seam as flat as possible as I sewed, so that the edge would be really crisp. All of this sewing, pressing and sewing ended up being almost two hours work, which is really the maximum I could do at that time before I had COVID. So I've actually done quite a lot more than I thought I would get to uh, since I last spoke to you. I've not only sewn everything up, so now my bodice has all its darts in, it's got its shoulder seams together, but it's also got its neck facing on, so I've spent a long time getting that lovely. It's got this um, vent V opening at the back. This, this is the back neck opening. So I've been working on that to get that lovely and understitching that and making it lovely and crisp and everything. The skirt is on the mannequin. So I'm leaving that, I'm gonna pin it on properly in a sec and leave that to hang because obviously it's a circle skirt and this is very, very lightweight and slippery fabric. So uh, yes, I'm gonna leave that to hang and drop and my neck is starting to hurt, so I'm gonna stop for now. And probably when I come back, I will be doing the armhole facing so that I can get the bodice uh, ready to attach to the skirt. So several hours lunch and a lie down later, I returned to this dress and began adding the armhole facings. That meant first I had to sew up and press the side seams. And then the armhole facings were attached right sides together, just like the neckline facing, but simpler. 
Again, I wanted to understitch this seam, so I pressed the seam allowance towards the facing before stitching it in place. I had to remove my tray table to get this over the arm of my machine, and you can see how I use my fingers to really separate that seam. This didn't take very long, only about half an hour. Okay, so my facings are now on, they're understitched in place. I've just pinned them at the shoulder seams and the underarm for now because strangely the next step is to skirt rather than joining it right sides together it says to overlap it and top stitch it on which is fine with me I think that's probably stronger this is a particularly floaty fabric so I'm gonna do what they suggest so I've got to press under the seam allowance first and baste it in place and then top stitch it onto the bottom of the bodice and then it's the side opening and the hem and I think that's it so we shall see it's coming together very quickly this dress I'm hoping I might get it done apart from the hem because the hem's got to drop originally I had intended to put a zip in this dress if you've been around for a while you will know my mixed feelings about zips but there are instructions for how to do an alternative placket facing um, opening in this dress from the vintage Vogue instructions and actually because this is such a light, drapey, uh, viscous. I actually think putting a zip in it is going to be really heavy and kind of too stiff and it's going to ruin the drape of the bodice. So I'm going for this placket instead and that will hopefully mean it can be a bit freer. We shall see how that turns out. At this point, I really should have stopped for the day, but I was on a bit of a roll, so I thought I'd carried on, only for what I was working on to go horribly wrong. I was trying to attach the skirt to the bodice, but as I was tired, I was rushing and cutting corners and I had to redo it. So I think I'm about done for the day. The skirt is attached to the bodice. Hang on. Ta-da! Uh, that was a bit of a palaver. I ended up tacking it. Don't know why I didn't tack it to begin with. You know, whenever I try and uh, cut corners for myself, I always end up making work for myself. Uh, so in future, just tack it. Tack it on and then top stitch it. Got a much better line. And I've tried it on and I really like it. I was a little bit worried because I don't generally do big all over prints like this. She says wearing an all over print today. So I was a bit worried it would look a bit like, I don't know, a nighty or something like that. But it actually looks really nice. This is supposed to be a late 40s, early 50s style pattern. But on me, it looks sort of 1930s and I'm not entirely sure why. It might just be the short hair. But yeah, I'm really pleased with it. I haven't gotten as far as I would like to today. But that's all right. Sometimes you've got to listen to your body and just rest. So tomorrow, ooh, I'm caught. Got to put in my placket and do the hem and some hand finishing on the facings just to keep them in. They're just pinned in place at the moment. And then it's done. Lovely, sweet little project. Uh, touch wood, nothing goes hideously wrong tomorrow. Then I had a day off from sewing, but when I came back, I began work on the placket. What I really liked about this Vogue reprint pattern, as opposed to the simplicity and butterick ones I have used previously, is that they kept more of the vintage construction techniques, like this placket. The placket uses strips of fabric to enclose the raw edges at the opening, much like you would for a waistband. The placket is machined onto the opening with right sides together and then pressed around to the inside and the seam allowance pressed under and hand stitched in place. Although in this case, I just pinned it in place for now as I was batching my tasks and saving all the hand sewing for the end. A lesson in why you leave your garments to hang when they're made of very lightweight fabrics and you have seams cut on the bias. Uh, can you see that was my original one and a half centimetre seam allowance where I attached the skirt to the waist. And as I was working on this placket, I realised that the back seam, where I'd hung it overnight to hang the skirt, has grown that much. That's where I've uh, had to move the waistline to now. That's where it was. Well, looking like at about two centimetres there, I reckon. Maybe not a centimetre and a half, but can you get... Oh yeah, look. Mm. Ah, so that's why you hang your clothes. Uh, I'm glad I caught it now. It wasn't that much of a difficult fix. Only unpicking, only unpicked up to the first dart and reattached the waist. But yeah, it did mean I had to take the placket off that I'd just sewn in. <laughs> but oh well, carrying on. Having reinserted the placket, it was time to mark the hem with my skirt hammer. 
My sewing room isn't big enough for me to get a shot of it in action, so here we are in my hallway. What this contraption does is spray chalk dust out of the little nozzle, which creates a faint chalk line on the fabric that is an equal distance up from the ground. Very handy if, like me, your body is not even all the way around. The one tricky thing about this is you have to stand up straight. You can see I'm often looking down, which makes the dress hang closer to the ground, and then the marks end up wonky. So I had to do a bit of evening up later on. And then that was it for the day. All the unpicking had really taken it out of me, so I left the hem and finishing for another time. To hem this very large circle skirt, I did a double fold hem. I folded up the raw edge of the skirt after I had trimmed it to be even and stitched it in place using a long basting stitch on the machine. This is not just to hold this very wobbly fabric in place, but it's also going to act as a gathering thread to shrink in the excess length of the hem for the second fold. I then press that first fold in place all the way around. While I had folded the first fold by eye as I sewed, for the second fold I measured it to be exactly 3cm all the way around. I pinned it in place, but as you can see as the skirt is flared, the top of the fold is longer than the fabric of the skirt it has to be sewn to. So I pull on that basting thread to gather up the excess and use the iron to shrink out as much of the volume as possible. This works better with natural fibres, but it worked to some extent with the viscose. I repeat this process for the whole hem, carefully measuring, pinning and shrinking, and then I stitch the hem in place by hand using a slip stitch. I chose a slip stitch as it means I can also use the thread that runs along the top folded edge of the hem to ease in that excess even more, making up for the places that I couldn't shrink out entirely with the iron. Sewing that massive hem was quite enough fiddly pinning and hand sewing for a little while, so four days later I came back to the rest of the hand finishing. The opening at the back neck needed a button and a loop. I chose a vintage button that I had also used on my rainbow jumper, as I had just one in this lighter colour left, and it matched the print perfectly. Rather than make a buttonhole, the pattern had you make a thread loop. I did this by sewing a few threads to make a loop big enough to go around my button and then buttonhole or blanket stitching over those threads to reinforce them. This was very time consuming and I did eventually realise that there was no way you could see what I was doing, so I hope this close up is a bit more enlightening, although you mostly just see the back of my hand. <laughs> then I had a few more bits to sort out. The placket needed hand sewing in place. Unlike for the hem, I used a felling stitch as it's stronger and this area will get quite a lot of strain. Then I had to add the fastenings. I used a skirt hook at the waistline as this area could be under more tension and a popper might, well, pop open when you don't want it to. But for the areas above and below the hook, I used poppers or snaps, press fasteners, whatever you want to call them. Then the dress was finished. I really love this dress. This viscose is so lightweight that it's really cool and comfortable to wear, and the full circle skirt makes it super swishy. The bias of the skirt is placed at the center front, so it drapes beautifully, which is something I'll remember for future circle skirts I make. Seams on the straight, center front on the bias. I'm loving the all-in-one sleeve. I know the closet historian is also a big fan, but now I really understand why. Not only are they quick to sew, but they hit in such a pleasing place, really helping with that vintage hourglass silhouette. It took me a total of six days to make this dress, but it was probably only about a total of 10 hours work, so I'd say that's a pretty quick project. You could of course make it even quicker if you don't make the mistakes I did and do things like use a zip and machine the hem. The only thing I would change is the armhole facings. I only tack them down at the shoulder seams and the underarm, but they're so floppy they slip out. I think I'm going to have to go back in and herringbone them in all the way around. It's the same with the facing at the back neck opening. It has a habit of poking out of the gap, so I think it needs sewing down more securely. It's quite long, but I like that because it's better for sitting down, which is how I spend most of my life, and it drapes very seductively over the knees. I really love this pattern. A massive thank you to Miss M for recommending it. I can't wait to make another version. I also am now really curious to try more of the Vogue reprint patterns because I found the instructions and the details made it much more like sewing from an original vintage pattern, 
So this could be a great option for you if true vintage patterns aren't accessible for whatever reason. I'd love to know if you've made any of the vintage Vogue patterns or have one you'd like to see me make. I'm desperate to try another. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.